This talk is about kinds of pronunciation that differ from the modernized received pronunciation that you're being taught in classes. So different from the way that uh, Mr. Ashby and I speak, for example. Because there are a large number of geographically different varieties of English pronunciation. All we can do is uh, have a look at some of the most important features that you will notice as you listen to people from various different origins. I've uh, got 11, well, 12 things listed on your handout, and we go through these one after the other. So the first concerns words spelt with NG. Historically, these words in general had ng, as we have nowadays in the middle of finger, or anger, or angry. However, in the course of history for most varieties of English, the g was lost when it was at the end of a word. So long became long, sing became sing, hang became hang. However, there was one region that resisted this innovation. And that was what I call here Northwest England. It includes such important cities as Liverpool, Manchester, and Birmingham. And people from those areas will often say singing and sing rather than singing that we have in other varieties of English. And the best way to test for this is to compare someone who sings, which for me is a singer, with the word finger. For most speakers of English, these words don't rhyme. We've got singer and finger, singer, finger. But for someone from Liverpool, for example, you have singer and finger, and they rhyme perfectly. Singer, finger. Well, uh, I call that loss of final go after n, and as I say, it's resisted in this patch of the northwest of England. This is not a feature which people feel, you know, sort of embarrassed about, or which they tend to change if they are speaking carefully. On the whole, it seems to be below the level of awareness for most of those who do it. Nevertheless, it's a very good geographical marker for those who have it. Here's another northernism from the north of England. And again, it's a matter of resisting a change that took place elsewhere. The uh, Middle English short vowel U underwent a split in early modern English. And we see this when we compare the words put and cut in most modern varieties of English. These don't rhyme, put, cut, put, cut, put, cut. Although the spelling tells you that they were once good rhymes, put, cut, and indeed they are still good rhymes in many varieties of North of England English. Put, cut. The actual quality can vary. You can get people from Newcastle on Tyne who say put and cut with really good like quality. You get people from Leeds, Birmingham, who have very earth-like qualities to say cut and cut. But the point is whether these words rhyme or not. Here's another pair. In most accents, full and dull have a different vowel because historical dull opened to an up giving on dull. This was a strange sound change because it affected some of the words but not all of them. You can't really formulate an environment, a phonetic environment, in which you change to a. Uh, you know, you feel like saying, well, it happened before, final L, full, pull, and so on, but then there's dull, which is an exception. Or you feel like saying it happened after labials, as in butcher, put, pull, but then there are words like butter, vulture, where it didn't happen. 
So we really have to say that it was a strange kind of, kind of sound change that affected some of the words that look like candidates for it, but not others. There are one or two words that still remain variable. Uh, I say pulpit, but there are people who say pulpit. Well, this split between the set that I call foot and the set that I call strut, or strut split, had a consequence for the vowel systems, looking at this more abstractly. We have a typical South of England short vowel system, which, as we saw last week, has six items in it, exemplified by the keywords kit, dress, trap, lot, strut, foot. And the point is that strut and foot, which are distinct, in received pronunciation and in most varieties of English, strut and foot, are not distinct in these northern popular accents, where we typically have only five short vowels, so kit, dress, trap, lot, and foot and strut. The vowel dress is typically a bit opener in the north, dress, but it's very variable everywhere. The vowel of trap is typically a bit more retracted, trap, not trap, uh, in Northern English. But again, that's pretty variable in different kinds of English. The crucial point is no contrast between foot and strut, so they rhyme, foot, strut, and therefore only five short vowels rather than six. <coughs> now, another thing that we identify people as northerners by concerns the vowel in words like bath. A set of words, some uh, 50 or 60 of them, many of them very common words in which historically there was a short vowel, but the south of England, south west, southeast of England, and received pronunciation underwent a change from a to r. So a historical Bath, with a short vowel, has become present-day bath. And I have a bath. I had a bath yesterday evening. I didn't have a bath. Though if I was speaking with a northern accent, I would have had a bath. And if I were an American, of course, I would have taken a bath, <laughs> which again reflects the short vowel that they inherited. They've done their own thing to it still. since then, and it's often actually quite long in duration in American bath of the quality that tells you it's like cat. Well, here are some typical words in which this feature can be found. As you can see, mostly the change happened, the broadening happened before voiceless fricatives. So the S of pass and glass and grass, northern pass, glass, grass, and the F of staff Raft, laugh, northern staff, raft, laugh. The voiceless dental fricative of bath, path, northern bath, path. And uh, others where you have clusters involving one of these fricatives after castle, northern after castle. However, again, we find that. Rather strangely, certain words that appear to be to, to meet the structural description of this sound change resisted it. And so in the south of England, in received pronunciation, we have a short vowel still in math, unlike path, we change path to path, but we haven't changed math to math, maths. Uh, similarly, though we've changed path to pass, we've kept mass as mass. There are some Catholics and one or two who say mass for special reasons, but in general it's mass in our feet. Similarly, tassel started out as a good rhyme for castle, and the other way around perhaps, castle, tassel. They still rhyme in the north of England, but not in my speech because I say tassel, as does everybody, and not tassel, as you might imagine. The sound change failed entirely before the palatal alveolar fricative. Everybody still has a short vowel in flash and dash and mash and crash and so on. So it's a funny old sound change. But as I say, it was resisted in the North of England and of course also in 
North America, which is why Americans have their hat. Oops, too far. There are some maps. Uh, Beth Collins may recognize where they come from. Showing you the approximate geographical distribution of these features. There's just a map of England with the counties <laughs> named, which you may find it helpful to relate to. Merseyside is the area around Liverpool. Greater Manchester is the area around Manchester. West Midlands is the area around Birmingham. So those are the three big cities up there. Uh, also the cities of Yorkshire, Leeds, Bradford, and so on. Hull and uh, Newcastle on Newcastle on time. I don't like to call it Newcastle or Newcastle. It's locally it's Newcastle, but of course I normally call it Newcastle up there. I think we you can ignore my new email message. <laughs> <laughs> this is the wonderful new version of Thunderbird that flashes that information on your screen every time a new email arrives. Anyhow, here are the maps then first of all of Bath broadening, and it's this southeastern area shown there in somewhat schematic form, which is where we find this change. The southwest is uh, sort of put with a question mark. In the southwest of England, you tend to get longish a ah for all these vowels. So, gas grass, which are different in the southeast, tend to be gas grass in the sort of uh, west of England accent. So, it's difficult to say whether or not they have this change. If we take it by saying, does do cat and grass have the same vowel, and then they probably do in most Western speech. Here's the other map, the one for book in strut words. And again, you can see this is something of the north of England. It doesn't go, you know, this is sort of an area of uh, Herefordshire and so on, where the two are different from one another. Furthermore, this extends into North Wales a bit. Okay. It's important to remember that both received pronunciation southeast and north of England accents north have two vowels. It isn't a matter of failing to have a distinction. Everybody distinguishes ham, the meat, from harm when you do harm to someone. Now, just how these are distinct can vary in different parts of the country. In received pronunciation, they might be ham, harm and also in London. In the north of England, they're typically ham and ham. So there's a difference of duration, John Bob, ham, ham, not much difference of quality. Or of course, dropping the H is ham and ham. In the west of England, where R is retained, you get ham and harm. In American English, you get ham and harm. Big, big old difference there. So the question here is not, how many vowels we have, but which words we use them in. In the typical southern accent, you've got a in trap, cat, and all those words. You've got r in start, father, and all those words. And bath goes with start, which means that bath rhymes with half. That's a fireplace, half, H-E-A-R-T-H. In the north of England, on the other hand, we've got trap, we've got start, and we've got bath with the right with the vowel of trap, not bath with the vowel of start. So it's just a question of which way the bath words go. Gas, pass, fast in the south, gas, pass, fast in the north. I sort of emphasize that as something because my native English students very often get this wrong. And indeed, Daniel Jones got it wrong, uh, <laughs> being a southerner, uh, with the idea that northerners just, just don't distinguish short and long at, which is not the truth, not the case at all. Ham and harm, patty party, cat and cart are different in all kinds of English. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> If we take words like face, historically these used to have a monothon, a simple vowel. As you may know, this word is originally Latin via French. The modern French pronunciation of that would be fast. It was borrowed into English as some sort of fast. 
And then we had the great vowel shift, which changed a ah into a. So fast became face. And this became, from being me faster, became my face or something in early modern English. Well, this a persists in various provincial kinds of English. So you will find people in parts of the north of England who say face, as you will indeed in Scotland, face, and Wales, face, and indeed parts of the United States, Wisconsin and so on, you can get something very like that, face. But most of us have turned it into a diphthong, so it's now face, a a a a a, which of course is what you are taught to say. Similarly, day. Well, the spelling gives you a kind of hint here that day was always a diphthong. Uh, Historically, at any rate. Some accents have turned it into a monothong, you being day, but uh, probably what we did in the south of England in RP is generalize the diphthong of A to the face words. The point is that the face set and the day set fell together and became identical. There are one or two people who, for whom they haven't fallen together. You can try this out with words like mane on a lion's neck, the hair on a lion is called the lion's mane, M-A-N-E, and the other word mane meaning chief, M-A-I-N, which of course are homophones for almost everybody, mane, mane, or mane, mane. But there are some people who say mane for the lion, and mane, or something like that, for a principle. Mane, 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 mane. I first came across this when I was a, a beginning lecturer, when I was an assistant lecturer in phonetics here, teaching elementary phonetics to native speaking uh, learners. And you teach them, of course, transcription. Here's a list of keywords, transcribe this passage. One of the students in my class, or my class, in my class, complained that he hadn't got enough symbols because it turned out that he made this difference between, between two types of A words. Some were A and some were A. And so could I please give him an extra phonetic symbol for the, this distinction? He came from a place called Kladach, Kladach near Swansea in the Swansea Valley. Uh, and I've since found that this is characteristic of that part of South Wales to have this distinction. We have something similar if we look at the O words, which we take goat as a typical keyword, where again we had a monothon or early modern English, which persists in some accents, but in general has turned into a diphthong, giving the O type, uh, which was RP of 100 years ago, a go, and uh, that in turn has turned into the O, goat of modern received pronunciation. And there is other kinds of diphthong in other kinds of accent. We saw in London it's an even wider diphthong, gao, gut, gut. So, quite a big change in that, or becoming O, becoming O, perhaps becoming O. Again, we can have this contrast preserved, making a difference between the tor on your foot and to tow a vehicle. And so my chap from uh, Pledach not only had eight versus lead distinct, but also tor versus tow distinct. But for most of us, they rhyme, or they rhyme perfectly, they place, or they are identical. Toe to toe. We come now to a very well known difference among different varieties of English. <coughs> Historically, as you can tell from the spelling, words like farmer had two R sounds, so it was farmer. As of course it still is in American English, in general, farmer. But in the history of my kind of English, when R was before a consonant, or at the end of a word, before a pause, it disappeared. So from farmer, you end up with just farmer. Farmer. And uh, well, this is called R dropping dropping the historical R, and it applies to many, many different varieties of English, those of 
most of England, except for parts of the west of England. Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, so the Southern Hemisphere. Most of the West Indies, though not all of it, complicated situation there. There are some Americans who drop these R's, though that's now receding in the face of the majority of Americans who retain these R's. R's are retained in Scotland and in Ireland on the whole. Generally speaking, Wales now follows England by dropping them. So we have a very sort of patchy situation if we look at the world in general. A consequence of this R dropping, as you can see from your handout, is that what were once distinct become identical. So for people who have a rhotic accent, that is retaining the R, uh, stork, the bird, and stork, the stem of a plant, are different. But for me and for most English people, stork and stork are identical. We make no distinction. And we just have to learn which word is spelt which way because they sound identical for us. Stork and stork. Similarly for the two words ma, you've got here, ma to do harm to something, and ma meaning mother. In um, words like nurse, in varieties of English that retain the R, it may coalesce with the preceding vowel. Now, not necessarily. In Scottish English, we get nurse, which is just like cup you drink from, strut, plus an R, nurse, nurse, which is what the spelling suggests, nurse. But in American English and in the west of England, the R coalesces with the vowel to give you nurse, nurse. You get an R-colored vowel, er, nurse. Well, that's a, a strange sound, and uh, in English English, we've simplified things by losing that R coloration, leaving behind R, er, nurse, nurse. Nurse. As far as schwa is concerned, in weak syllables, well, you had an R colored schwa in words like letter. What do we have on the handout? Yes, letter, 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 letter. We lost the er coloration again, giving us letter. And this means that we now have a perfectly ordinary er uh at the end of words like letter. Uh, yes, just before we move on to the next thing, this means that uh, oh, if we have, for example, the name of the country China, and finer, meaning more fine, they rhyme perfectly for us, China, finer, but they don't rhyme for people who retain historical R because they have China and finer. Strangely enough, it was Americans who say that nothing could be finer than South Carolina in the morning. They must have been American southerners who drop R's like they do. Okay, one more point here. These first six changes we're looking at, by the way, are all of them things that changed in the history of received pronunciation. And what we've been looking at is accents that resisted that particular change. So here's another one which has just about disappeared now from our key, though it may leave the odd trace here or there. And this is the simplification of qu cluster. So, where historically it was why, as you can tell by the spelling, WH, we've simplified it to why. When's become when, which has become which, making it the same as the other word which. Somewhere has become somewhere. And pairs that were once distinct as wine and wine are now usually identical, why and why. This change is resisted in general in Scottish English and in Irish English, although there are now reports of people in Scottish cities, young people in Scottish cities following the English habit, and also in Belfast. But in general, Scottish and Irish English retain the qua. So do some Americans, but it's clearly receding fast in American English, just as it has receded in British English. I uh, tested this out with one of my surveys when I asked people to record their preference. You can't ask people to tell you what their pronunciation is because they don't know and they will probably report it wrongly. But you can ask them which pronunciation they prefer 
of two pronunciations. So I asked them whether they like to pronounce the color white identically with the Isle of Wight off the coast of southern England or differently from that. So differently means it's white, the same means it's white. And here is this tabulated by their date of birth. And you can see that people born up to 1933 were about equally divided. People of my age group born between 34 and 53 had a clear majority for white. Those born later had even clearer majorities and people born what, 30, 35 years ago even more firmly. And I'm sure if we extrapolate it further, we'll find that people born more recently, even fewer of them, pronounce it without well. This was a, a survey of the entire British variety of English, so we've got to remember that there are Scots and so on who will no doubt retain quirk. I think this means that for the youngest age group here, virtually all the English and Welsh are voting for play W. Here's a map of the same thing in the United States. On this map, the blue dots are meant to indicate a distinction. The yellow dots are meant to indicate that they're close, whatever that means. And the black dots mean no distinction. Well, you can see a very muddled pattern there, because we've got lots of black dots, well, really everywhere. The proportion of black dots to blue dots uh, doesn't show any enormous geographical distinction that I can see. Uh, perhaps black dots cluster much more in the Middle Atlantic area here, New York is there, Philadelphia and so on there. Uh, on the other hand, the retention of the quirk is perhaps typical of the Boston area, Massachusetts. It's dropping also clearly in California, perhaps not in Sacramento. So, muddled picture in the United States there. Okay, that's our first six sound changes. And in every case, as I say, we've been looking at some innovation which lies in the history of my kind of English, but has been resisted in one place or another so that that change didn't take place. We have to look now at changes that have taken place. Well, we did this when we talked about Cockney and Estuary English, because all of those almost all of those special Cockney features represented innovations on top of what we have in received pronunciation. Uh, this is a general feature about the southeast of England, but it has innovations, whereas the north of England, generally speaking, uh, fails to make changes that took place elsewhere. Okay, well, the Americans, they've got really the changes that took place up to about 1700, 1750 in the south of England. But since then, they've gone their own way. So they haven't incorporated the changes that we did since about 1750, in particular, R dropping and bark broadening. Uh, and they've also had innovations of their own. One of these concerns developments before R. Historically speaking, words like bear had the E vowel of peace and so on, as in one, two, three, E, B, with an er after it, beer, as the spelling suggests. So beer, to drink, was just like B, the insect, plus er, beer. And that's still what it is in Scottish English. A kind of beer, beer, beer. But of course, what happened in my kind of English is the E developed into a diphthong air in this position, Beer became bear, and then we dropped the R, giving us bear. We retain the R as a linking R before a following vowel. So beer and something or other became bear and something or other, and that stays still as bear and something or other in general. Where the R is not final in the word but before a consonant, then beard becomes beard becomes beard and the R is lost in the history of received pronunciation and so on. Well, what happened in American English? They didn't have the R dropping, of course, 
but they had a different kind of development before the R. What happened really was that they lost the distinction between E and A, green and grim. That distinction disappeared before R in American English. Giving you some kind of bear. Now, some Americans feel this to be uh, an E, beer. Others feel it to be an A, bear. And perhaps most of them feel it to be uh, a short A, bear. So that's how we transcribe it for general America, bear. The main point, though, is that before R, the range of possible vowels is reduced in American English. Look, have I got any pictures for the remaining ones? So just have a look at your handout for the, some of the other uh, positions. When we've got uh, fair, well, remember what's A plus er, like the vowel face plus R, fair, 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 we developed the diphthong, fair, Lost the R, fair. Americans kept the R, but shortened the vowel, giving fair. Fair. This means that in American English, if you take Merry, as in Merry Christmas, and Mary, as in the girl's name, Mary, Mary Poppins, they, for many Americans, are identical, Mary, Mary. And that's because they've lost the distinction between long and short vowels before R. Something more has happened in American English. That for many of them, the vowel A ah, has joined in. So in a word like narrow, although some Americans say narrow, perhaps most say narrow. Narrow. And that means that not only Mary and Mary, but also marry, get wed, become the same. And so you get Mary, 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 all three of them the same. I've just been in a recording studio recording Americans, uh, well, should we say, attempting to say words like narrow, but it's pointless to try and persuade them to do so because that's not an option in their English. They've really got to say narrow. So those are special American developments, and there are other ones which I won't get into before a foreign R. Another very well-known feature of American English is the vowel in words like lot, the lexical set of lot. <coughs> well, in uh, RP and so on, we have a rounded back <coughs> vowel, ah, 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 ah. Americans typically have an unrounded vowel, ah, 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 so rather than a a bottle of scotch, Americans say a bottle of scotch. Bottle, bottle, a lot. A lot of bottles of scotch. I think I haven't got a picture of this, but if you look on your handout, yes, I have got a picture of this. If you look on your handout, there's the pair of words bother and father. Now, these don't rhyme in any kind of British English. We all retain the distinction between R and bother, whatever that might be, and the R of father, however that might be pronounced. Bother, father, bother, father. But you can see that in American English, they typically end up with the same sound, bother, father. Don't bother me. He's my father. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing at my attempts at American English. <laughs> well, anyhow. Uh, so that's a good diagnostic again for finding Americans. Canadians, on the other hand, may often have a distinction because they say father and father, the front of our father. All right, next, uh, lots of distinctive length in American English. Next thing of American English, again, a very well known feature, which is T voicing. In various positions between vowels, Americans have added voicing and, shall we say, acceleration to the articulation of T. So instead of a voiceless alveolar plosive, they tend to get a voiced sound. Atom turns into Adam. And this means that the distinction between Atom, the small particle, and Adam, the first man, is lost and we have Adam for both of them. Adam, atomic, and Adam, an Eve. Adam. You also note that the 
I say the sound gets accelerated. The, the contact, the alveolar contact is speeded up, making it into a kind of tap, almost like the R sound of some languages. Adam, 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 Adam. But that applies to both T and D in this environment. So <clears throat> it doesn't affect the point, the crucial point, which is that T and D fall together. Uh, the word city in American English therefore becomes city. I've shown this on your handout by using the symbol for the tapped R, uh, but do remember that also applies to D. Indeed, this touches on a, a, an area that's actually rather difficult to get to grips with. One of the main ways in which we recognize particular regional or social varieties is not by the tiny details of any particular articulation, not by the system that we've got that we've been looking at or whether things are the same or different, but things like rhythm, voice quality, uh, features of intonation. And if we consider the word ready, are you ready? I don't know if any of you can identify what happens if I slow it down. Who might say, are you ready? Are you ready? That's a slow D. That's characteristic of Welsh English, perhaps exaggerated Welsh English. Oh, I'm not ready. Like that. On the other hand, if I speed it up, ready? Are you ready? That's American English. And I think in my sort of British world, ready is perhaps intermediate between those two extremes. Well, that's the kind of thing I really find very difficult to analyze, but obviously for every accent we have to specify some typical duration for every segment, and it may well differ from one accent to another, very tricky. But I should think that's the sort of thing that uh, in forensic phonetics, such as Phil Harrison talked about, would be very important. <coughs> well, there's what I said in the long pronunciation dictionary about T voicing, and uh, well, if you're interested in the further details, where it happens, where it doesn't happen, there's something about it. One important fact is that it applies at the end of words. So you've got, say, great, voiceless T, but a great idea, voicing it. And people often say to me, well, why don't you show it in the dictionary? And the problem is there are thousands of words ending with T, and you have to have double entries for all of these, and that's obviously not an efficient way to do it. So it's better to show it or write inside a word, but not at the end of a word, but to tell you the rule for it. Here's a nice phrase for practice. Not only, but also. Not only this, but also that. And in conservative varieties of English, like in my careful speech, those T sounds are voiceless alveolar plosives. Not only this, but also that. Voiceless alveolar plosive. This tells us about the three features that distinguish this sound from other sounds. And each of these features may be modified when we look at other varieties of English. So first of all, we can modify the place of articulation. Instead of making it alveolar, we can make it glottal. And that gives us the, the, gives us the London style, not only this, but also that. Not only, but also. This is glottaling, T glottaling, as we saw, it's on the increase in received pronunciation, what we receive pronunciation. And so there are many younger speakers of educated British English, what they now like to call Southern British English, terrible misnomer. It's really son of RP, modern RP. Uh, you get this global stop not only, but also. People of my age, no, 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 I don't do that. The other thing that can happen is that it becomes voice, not only this, but also that. I think I probably do that in rapid speech sometimes, not only, but also. Certainly, uh, Benta Hanisdal, a Norwegian who's recently carried out a very interesting study of modern RP as seen in the speech of television newsreaders, reports this as being extremely frequent in function words like these, though not so much in lexical words. 
And in, in American English, of course, as we've seen, this occurs not only in function words, but also, but also, but also in uh, content words. The uh, other things that can happen to this is to modify the manner of articulation. Instead of having it as a plosive, to turn it into something else. Irish English is well known for turning it into a fricative. So in Irish English you get not, o not only, but also. Not only, not only, not... A kind of almost S-like fricative. It isn't S-like, it isn't grooved as S is, so it's a kind of ungrooved alveolar fricative. And there is a difference in, Ar a difference in Irish English between his, which is to strike, and his which is to make an S noise, his and his. So they are distinct, contrastive still, but we have this, my, there we are, uh, this opener kind of T. I think you also get this in uh, colloquial, very fast RP too, not only, but also. But we don't do it as much as the Irish do. One further thing that happens in the north of England is what I call the T to R rule, for uh, lack of a better name for it. As far as I can see, I'm the first person to describe this in writing, but it's a very well-known feature of rough northern speech where you get nor only, nor only this, but also that. Shut up for shut up. And put it down for put it down. All right, next thing to do with yod. Uh, like Londoners, Americans drop yod after n. So they say news typically rather than news. It's variable in American English. There are a few people who say news, but most Americans say news. And where in British English we say tune, or the derived coalescent tune, Americans keep tune, typically. And of course, there are other words like suit, where on the whole we drop the yog, but Americans always drop it. And words like resume, where we generally retain it, though with some variability, and the Americans drop it and say resume. Or enthusiasm, as I pronounce it, which is enthusiasm in American English. So rather more yard dropping uh, for them than for us. Uh, there is a map of uh, an American development that I haven't talked about, which is the innovation of a and the contrast or otherwise between R and or. Uh, if you look at the blue lines here, these tell you about the distinction between stock and stalk that we looked at. Americans have got Possibility, actually, sorry, I've got the possibility of merging R as in court, cart, and R as in lot, lot, giving cart and lot as perfect rhymes. And this means that if someone says their name is Don, you don't know whether it's a man called Don, D O N, or a woman called Dawn, D A W N, because in American English they can both be Don. The blue areas here are the areas that resist that sound change. So most Americans have it, particularly those in the West, and those <coughs> are shown on the map we don't. Well, it's difficult probably to look at these in detail, so we better move on, because the last thing we need to look at is Australian English. Just to say a few words about that, Australians have only had 200 years or rather less to develop their own characteristic variety. Uh, as compared to the Americans who've got nearly 400 years. So Australian English is much closer to British English, Southeastern English English, than American English. Uh, however, they have got some typical innovations, one of which is merging weak vowels. So I make a difference between the plural of office, which is offices, and the plural of officer, which is officers. Australians typically have them identical, officers, officers. Mind you, there are some British people who have them the same as well. And John Maidment, in his reader, in his uh, transcription book, advises you to transcribe them in the same way. So uh, I have to say that's a possibility in English English. Australians don't have a lot of stops, unlike Londoners. This is the easiest way immediately to distinguish between 
a London accent and an Australian accent, if you find them similar. Australians have two voicings, they say better. Uh, Londoners might say better. Another thing very characteristic of Australian English concerns the vowel in words like start, back in the southeast of England, R, 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 start, car park, front in Australian English, A, uh, start, car park. You also get that in some regional forms of English English, Liverpool, Manchester, but uh, not in the southeast. On the other hand, the diphthong shift in Australian English is like what happens in London. Well, with that very quick look at Australian English, we've come to the end of our time. So we've seen interesting changes that have happened in some places, unlike the earlier lot we looked at, which were changes that didn't happen in other places. Thank you very much.